Yeah, let me see. Record it with this computer. I Recording in computer. progress. Okay, there we go. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Doctor is all I think. It's nice to see you. Uh, I'd like to talk about the origins of science and give something back to the medical community because you folks really did wonderful work during the COVID mess and God knows what we'll see in the future, but people should be very thankful to. That's just my view. And so, you know, since I don't own a bar and can't let you drink for free, I figure I'd, I'd give a class for doctors and cover some of the things that I think doctors would be interested in, particularly uh, Galen and Hippocrates, uh, because I'm confident that you know who they are, but it's hard to fit in a reading of stuff like that, uh, given the very regulated undergraduate courses that you have to take to get into medical school. So I have been told that, uh, you know, there's a number of doctors that wanted to take the course. I, I have a, a number of friends who are doctors or people, acquaintances who are doctors that I couldn't get to. I know where they work, but it's the interference that hospitals run for their doctors. I guess it makes sense, but uh, there are a couple that I'm still trying to get. Uh, there's also one whose name is identical to mine. He's a surgeon in Ireland. And every couple of weeks, I get an invitation to publish my opinions about some kind of surgery. And I'm tempted sometimes to actually tell them what I think of surgery, which I guess would reveal itself. But um, I bet he gets uh, similar things that are intended for me that end up being uh, uh, not within his uh, purview. Oh, okay. Admit. Okay. So, uh, I don't know how many, how many we have here. Um, is everybody in? Is there anybody that can't hear me? Are we good? Okay. Uh, this I thought was the, uh, date for the doctor's class. So that's what I expected to do coming here. But, uh, uh, and I don't know how many doctors I have. I know Jay is, uh, is another one. Okay. Uh, but uh, I wanted to talk about uh, the readings, particularly because I'm in the process of writing a history of the world. And as you might imagine, there's a lot of ways to slice that cake. And the way I did uh, almost 40 years ago now, when I got my first postdoc, I was at Johns Hopkins and they hired me to invent from scratch a history of the world. Now I was a newly minted PhD <laughs> and I had no idea what I was signing on to do. I mean, imagine if you got a degree in the sciences and they asked you to teach a course, or actually to make a course up from scratch, but not about chemistry or ecology or uh, uh, physics, but rather about nature. <laughs> and then you're supposed to include everything that's known about nature or some reasonable sketch of that, of all the sciences and the general understanding of nature. Now you realize what a horrible decision I had made, but I was stuck with it. So, uh, I've been working on a book now for, well, I don't know, probably close to 10 years, and it's organized around the history of science. And so this is uh, an unusual way to frame the history of the world, and it allows me to do things with scientific topics and technological topics, like, for example, Hippocratic medicine. I can show how Hippocratic medicine is an extension and extrapolation of the world's first scientific revolution. And you couldn't have had Hippocratic medicine and this new step forward towards an observation-based, non-magical 
medical science without changing the way people look at the world. So Hippocratic medicine was one of the applications of a new theory of nature. Steve Feldman is here. You know he is a doctor. Hello, Steve. All right. So Hippocratic medicine is going to turn out to be part of a general trend of society adjusting to a new conception of the natural world. Now, the Greeks, about 600 BC, created the world's first uh, uh, non-mythological natural science. And uh, what that allows them to do is uh, account for the world in a much more uh, sophisticated way. Applied science is technology. So no more witch doctors for the Greeks. No more magic dust. No more singing a song to the spirits that cause sickness. Instead, they ask stuff like, what did you eat yesterday? <laughs> or, uh, uh, you know, did you go anyplace unusual? Did you Were you exposed to something potentially dangerous? Uh, you know, like going into a swamp. They didn't know that mosquitoes were the cause of malaria, but they thought that bad air caused it. Think of the term malaria. That's what that's what malaria is. You go to some place where the air causes you to become sick. So uh, that is a big step forward, as uh, as opposed to the uh, the sickness spirits or the sickness spooks that a witch doctor would try and exercise and drive away. So uh, Hippocratic medicine is going to turn out to be real cool. And uh, we'll be able to talk about the history of Greek medicine, and I'll be able to compare it to ancient Chinese physics, which is really cool. It took me a long time to work my way through that, and there's a lot of cool stuff there. Um, what did you folks think of the readings, and uh, what's peculiar about uh, the actions and thought of the people involved? You must have some kind of uh, response to that. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I, I was um I was confused as to to the very short. You give us a couple verses from Exodus. Um, yeah, I, I, w I wasn't sure exactly like what what to get out of those. Um, like what what connection you were trying to to have us make with that one? Okay, that's a lot of fun. Uh, what did Exodus tell us? Well, um. If a bull gores somebody, the master will be will be uh, held accountable if it's not the first time. If it is the first time, you pay a fine. But but and uh, even if the master is not held liable, the bull has to be killed because it has blood pollution. And you can't just you just you can't just kill it the way you kill uh, an animal when you're going to slaughter it, right? Because this is unclean. This is trade, right? The reason why it's a murderous bull. Now they actually uh, hold it to be a lawbreaker. Now nobody nowadays, I assume, would be tempted to uh, hold an animal. Uh, legally responsible for its conduct because we don't think that they're morally or legally capable of doing things in the sense that people are. I mean, nowadays, even if we have a bad dog that has a tendency to bite people, we're not going to put him in the electric chair right? <laughs> and uh, kill him the way we would a murderer because, well, it's just a dog that is a public nuisance. But the bull that gores someone to death, and there's a different fine you pay, that bull has blood pollution, and it can't be slaughtered the way regular animals that you eat are. It has to be stoned to death, which is the uh, punishment for a human being that kills somebody. So here we have a bull that seems to fulfill all the standards for legal culpability for murder. Well, now these people are, are cutting the world up into a very in a very strange way, very different from the way we do. 
their categories are not like ours, right? They're groping towards the towards the question of who is responsible for what, right? Are individuals responsible or are collectives responsible? Remember the idea that people get uh, God's wrath, all right, as a group often, right? So it's not just individual. Um, on the other hand, uh, the idea of individual responsibility begs the question, individual what? Individual people? Well, how about individual animals, particularly if they're big and have horns? Note there's no passage in Exodus which tells you uh, how to uh, slaughter murderous sheep, right? <laughs> so uh, again, we would be inclined to put the cow and the sheep together as a set of categories and keep the people over here. And we're only going to have laws and trials and stuff and punishments for the people. They're splitting it up. They got a bull and a man. And over here, we got the sheep. <laughs> Do you see how uh, flexible and uncertain the categories are that far back? All right. And it's not just the case of, hmm, that's a murderous bull. Uh, there are, uh, I mean, the case of Theages, right? That's the case of the murderous statue. So Theages is a great boxer. One of his rivals gets angry when uh, a statue is erected in the towns in the city square to Theages. He comes out one night. I get I, my guess is alcohol was involved just <laughs> from the way this turned out, but he decided to bullwhip the statue. Now, unfortunately, the whip wrapped around the statue. He pulled to free it and pulled the statue down on himself, and it killed him. Now, his family demanded legal proceedings against the statue. It was found guilty of murder. And since they couldn't quite kill it, they banished it. They took it out and dumped it into the sea. Now, I don't think many of us would be tempted to hold any sort of inanimate object uh, legally or morally responsible. Uh, you know, it's like saying, well, that's a wicked meteor. Well, we don't make moral judgments about meteors because that's what they do. And uh, gravity is the same for everybody. So uh, what people are groping towards in the early phases of culture is an understanding of what counts as us, in other words, subjects, and what counts as nature, the external world, which would be objects, right? And it gets a little fuzzy and a little tricky with animals, right? I think Descartes's right about that. But uh, it's not really so fuzzy or unclear when you're talking about large pieces of granite. Right? I mean, you would think that it would be fairly easy to distinguish between the kind of thing that has legal and moral liability and a statue. But no, I mean... I mean, think of how strange it would be if uh, we were to uh, to uh, try John Wilkes Booth for murdering Lincoln and then also try the bullet and the gun. Well, we don't hold objects to be responsible for stuff, so we don't do that anymore. All right. So think of what I'm asking you to do is to think about how strange and fluid their categories are. Right, And it's not just the ancient Hebrews. You'll find it among the Greeks. They're trying to figure out who they are and how they relate to nature, which turn out to be two aspects of the same question. Yeah, this kind of connects um, into the pre-Socratics, um, which uh, one of them, I can't remember the exact name of the one who is, suggests that every every object, everything has God in it, uh, its own spirit. Yeah. Um, and that that's what makes those things do what they do. It's they're controlled by their spirit. Gods. So there's a, a God in my broom and there's a God in the dust on my windowsill. 
That's a very strange. I mean, what? I mean, again, you see how we're stretching categories here. Well, that's a very strange thing to attribute divinity to. Locusts are God. <laughs> Tree bark is God. All right, you know, pantheism always runs up against the kind of uh, difficult detail of life. But okay, let's get beyond everything is God. Uh, so all things are full of gods. How about this? I read that as him trying to say or trying to frame an idea that his society and his language doesn't have. And imagine how difficult it is to try and explain what we regard as uh, obvious and in some ways primitive. I don't mean primitive in the sense of, uh, of unsophisticated. I mean primitive in the sense of basic, right? Uh, it's... Damn it, I lost my shot. Primitive, what was primitive? Uh, I'm sorry about that. It's basic because of my cancer meds. That's okay. Um, the idea that God is in everything. Um, oh, yeah, okay. What, what he's trying to put together is, and, and to explain to people, uh, in a language that doesn't have a vocabulary to talk about this stuff. I think when he says that all things are full of gods, and that includes such trivial, mundane things, they don't seem very divine at all. I think he's trying to explain universal causality. That's what I think he means by that. In other words, suppose you had a society that just, of course, the world was causally related. Everybody knows that. But suppose you had a society that didn't have a word for abstractions like cause and effect. There are, in fact, such societies. Okay, how would you go about explaining the idea of causality to them? I mean, it's fairly easy when you want to to explain an idea or to explain a thing like a, a shoe or a river, right? What do you, how do you explain causality to people that have never thought of it and have no word for it? Dominoes. <laughs> what? Hey, dominoes. Man. Dominoes. All right. That's a nice example. Uh, Dr. Feldman, you're right about that. We could give them dominoes. Uh, but then the problem is, that it's entirely possible that they're going to look at that the way my dog looks when I try and point and gesture to her. All she sees is a moving hand. She doesn't see any symbol at all. You're going to point to falling dominoes, and then you're going to give get at some of those Humean billiard balls moving each other around the table, and we'll get a couple of other things, and they may will say, well, what are the rules to this very complicated game? There is no reason to believe they're going to say, ah, causality. <laughs> they may well have, what is this guy talking about? And that is part of the problem that they had with Thales. All is water. Well, look, the guy's trying to talk about the phases of matter. And we get rid of all the spooks and spirits. He likes things clean and tidy. So even though he doesn't state it, I have a feeling he has a tendency towards simplicity that William of Ockham would really like. Uh, remember the first book of the Iliad? Doctors, what causes epidemics? Apollo is pissed off, right? Uh, uh, the Agamemnon disrespected the priest. Apollo uh, took that personally. And he, Apollo's arrows are the cause, the invisible cause of your epidemic. And of course, as I said, uh, I guess last week, uh, you're only as good as your presuppositions. If you live in a world that you think is populated by spooks and spirits and all kinds of stuff that are really subjects, well, then it makes perfectly good sense to talk to them and work out a deal. In other words, the ancients that we're talking about are by no means stupid. It's just that the software that they're running is really primitive. It's like, it's like angry birds on a mainframe. What human culture is, is the software that that thing runs. And human beings can be thought of as machines that program themselves. They can also be regarded as uh, the only animals that domesticate themselves. And how we do that is a very long and complicated process. But yeah, that's part of the deal as we uh, 
develop science and develop nature, we develop an understanding of ourselves. And so I'll show you how uh, things like law or literature are in fact uh, resonating sympathetically with the, with the revolution of, in physics that started with Thales. And then we get an Aximander. Now he wants to tell you about the unbounded. In case you hadn't known, the unbounded has no bounds. Apart from that, it's not clear what to think about this thing. Hypothetically speaking, I could be wrong, but what if he's talking about an idea that the, <laughs> that they just don't have in his society? Space. In other words, they had to stack things, they had to put things away, but they may well not have an abstraction that corresponds to space. And when you try to explain it to your neighbor, you go, well, you know, space. And he goes, no, I have no idea what you're talking about. Why are you gesturing at nothing? And <laughs> this is by no means uh, uh, an intuitive or obvious idea, which is why these abstractions take relatively long to develop in human society, right? Uh, and, you know, Part of this is also going to be the development of mathematical knowledge. Pythagoras is going to create a math cult, all right? And he decides that everything is numbers because he passed by a blacksmith shop. He hears the different size hammers. He realizes that these correspond to musical intervals and he works out the ratio. And then he takes that home and starts to mess around with guitar strings of varying lengths and he finds that the ratios are the same everywhere. And then he goes to the Temple of Apollo and sacrifices a bull. <laughs> Why? Well, he did the same when he got the uh, theorem of Pythagoras. Mathematical knowledge is a kind of magic, and it comes from the gods. Remember, this far back, astronomy and astrology are still the same discipline. That's what makes this great Greek idea, this new non mythological, non-poetic, anti-Homeric account of nature, what makes it unsettling is that it transforms the world we live in. And when you do that, whether we like it or not, we also transform our understandings of who we are and what we are. So every scientific revolution generates a revolution in the other humanistic disciplines, law, politics, psychology, ethics, uh, uh, literature, whatever you want, the various arts. But you can have a transformation in any of those humanistic societies or uh, in any of those humanistic activities without a corresponding uh, transformation in the theory of nature. So it's unidirectional, it's not bi-directional. It's like why Bill Gates is so rich, every new operating system is like physics. That requires that you get all these new uh, applications because it won't run on the new operating system. But you can get new applications to run on a system without changing the operating system. So in other words, what's foundational to our understanding of the world uh, or, or in history, is our collective understanding of the world, of nature. And that the wor that history is a dialectic between uh, our understanding of the external world and our understanding of ourselves, which is subject and object, but not it from some German idealist fog machine. This is actually something that really happens. A fascinating aspect of this is that it follows. Um, I view culture as like software, the brain is like hardware, and history is directly continuous with evolutionary biology. What happened is that human beings took evolution to a quantum leap, to a new orbit, and they did that by inventing symbolism which allowed them to collect a whole bunch of their thoughts and eventually put it on the internet. So the idea then is this, we can do something that the other clever apes can't, which is use symbols. Nobody else does that. The Toba Volcano, this is where my history starts, the Toba Volcano 
73,000 BC, human population is down to 5,000. We are all <laughs> descended from that small town. <laughs> That's it. And what we have is about, uh, oh, 2,400 generations, given 29-year generations. And uh, I chart the uh, population of the world. And for the, it's a long graph because I'm starting at 73,000 and coming to the present. So the first six pages, the bottom of the graph and the bottom line, the axis doesn't move. All right. So the idea is you keep turning this. This is in the abstract. This might be the abstract. I mean, I don't have to say anything. Uh, race ips or doctors, you know what that means. Uh, after you flip six pages, then there's a slight bump about 3000 BC because it turns out that civilization allows people to populate and thrive and it gets up slightly. And then about 1500, uh, 20 generations ago, it increases 32 fold, which means it does this. <laughs> no, I mean, that's what the, that's what the graph of the world population looks like. If you were to look at any other organism besides human beings, your reaction would be, my God, this thing has never done so well. I mean, it's about to take over the planet. It's taken over its Petri dish, and it promises to take over more. Uh, you know, kill it before it grows. Might be, uh, I might have that tendency. But my point is, um, while we expect more from a successful individual human life or our collective life as a species, um, while... Uh, thriving in a numerical sense is necessary. It's not sufficient. On the other hand, it is really necessary. If our population to continue to shrink from that 5,000 to just Dr. Feldman, whose skin would he fix? His own. I mean, there's no, nothing else to do, right? So my point is, yeah, this is an underestimated fact that the last 500 years, which would also be the age of uh, Western expansion, um, increased the number of human beings dramatically. And it did so in a number of ways. It transferred all kinds of important crops so people could get more and better calories. It also uh, uh, forced global trade. And those of you who know economics, the division of labor in society is what allows for increasing skill, but also uh, increasing interdependence. And the result is an increase in aggregate wealth, right? Remember Adam Smith in the pin factory? You want to make your own safety pin or you want to get some other, uh, some other uh, uh, job and buy safety pins for a dime, all right? So when the disintegrated world was finally unified and it was unified in a really violent and, and cruel way. Um, the result was in some ways, it's like uh, the advent of industrialization. There was a couple of generations where people got abused and used and treated with the utmost hardship, but in the long run, spreading these things out, particularly giving more calories to more people, um, actually had the re had the result of making people that previously had just been a subsistence pop above subsistence and then start reproducing successfully. So I, I hold it as very important that we not lose sight of the fact that as a species, we've never done better. The problem is uh, a lack of integration within the species. Uh, in my book on the history of the world, I think that the the big problem for our species is this, and I don't know what the solution is, but um, the big problem is how to how to reconcile love and reason. And if they if you can't have both, which is Trump? I mean, I don't want the the connotations. I mean, which is which is more important? Which do you choose? And that's not easy or obvious, right? Uh, I think that that dropping the bomb on Hiroshima made perfectly good sense, given the logic of war. I also think it's an abomination. 
and that being reasonable maybe isn't everything. And that's the that's the side advocated more by Jesus and Buddha than by Socrates or uh, any of the, or perhaps the Stoics. I think the Stoics, a Roman Stoic might well have dropped the bomb. But looking at it, um, I have to choose between love and reason because I can't have them both. Imagine these as a Venn diagram and there are two little crescents on the far side and you can't have them both. Okay. Which are you going to choose? One over the other. You can't have them both. And what would be your justification the way? So that's the problem that I don't know how to solve. I admire and really value reason. Uh, I don't like the kind of religious or moral thought that just throws up their hands and says, look, you know, I believe. On the other hand, uh, while I think science describes the world beautifully and effectively, it doesn't tell us what we're supposed to do with this beautifully described world, whether we should be benevolent toward one another or whether we should build cluster bombs. <laughs> And after thinking it over, I'm thinking, well, you know, it's a hard balancing act. Don't Jesus, Gandhi, and King, wouldn't they say that love is reason? That that their approach is the way to achieve your aims? Okay. Well, here's the deal then. Um, uh, let, me, let me think of an example. Uh, if love is reason... Um, what is it that, well, hold on. I mean, how many of you have fallen in love? How many of you said, my, my reason is becoming increasingly acute. Boy, I'm nothing but reason now. I'm just saturated in reason. Or like does your reason completely collapse in the presence of beautiful women? Because we're all susceptible to that, or at least many of us are. Paris uh, is. What? Paris is in the Iliad. <laughs> okay, yeah. That that's it. Well, you know, he's got the goddesses against him, and so it's not really his fault, or it's only partially his fault. But his his brother should have turned that ship around and kicked his butt and her butt out at Mycenae. I mean, I mean, we'd lose a good story, but it's just such a terrible waste of you know uh, an excellent society, you know. The, the face that launched a thousand ships, you know, how many men died for this point of honor, right? There, Steve, I think you may be right. Uh, uh, rationality and love may require that you just step back from this. Sometimes they are the same thing. But what, what happens when they're not? When, uh, I don't know, when self-interest, like, say, dropping the bomb and ending the war, World War II quickly, um, at least seems to be at odds with uh, showing a mercy that they would not show us. Yeah, I think Jesus would argue they would show it to us. That if instead of the dropping the bomb, we just said, we're going home, you know, we're not going to destroy your cities. We could, but we love and care about you and we want to live together in peace. So you don't want to, you, you, you want to call a second world war off? Yeah, I think Jesus would have done that at, at that point. Yeah, but I, I think Possible. Jesus would have been fully, fully ready to to be killed in in the wake of like that. That you don't do that. So like this is kind of my my thinking on a lot of this. Um, I have a friend who um does a lot of Hegel, and he and I have this reason love debate often. Um, mm -hmm. and so for me, uh, the way I sort of try to describe it more is is you know, love is very easily warped and, and put to our own, like, it's not so much, you know, love itself so much as what the orientation of that love is. Is it, is it uni unidirectionally outward from you? In which case, which is what Jesus argues for, in which case Jesus is not thinking about necessarily what the consequences, he's not saying, oh, we should love them because they are going to surrender uh, and if we show love to them, they'll love us back. He's saying, no, you love them. End of story. It's a sacrificial love. It doesn't have to uh, pan out. I think that Jesus was probably like that. But uh, 
I'm not sure uh, of Jesus' pacifism. I mean, I have to admit, lots of stuff about Jesus I don't understand. So you have to give me a little bit of break there. I did my best with him. Um, but what he does seem to want is moral order. And so, yeah, if we could get people to just all of a sudden become sane, then I think that Dr. Felpin's idea of just, well, let's just walk away from the war um, would be a fine one. And this actually happened once. Steve, are you familiar with the Christmas truce? World War I? Holy Christ. Uh, this will knock you down. It was Christmas, and it's a time of peace, and it's a time of celebration. And these guys were, you know, 500 yards from each other in their uh, their bunkers and their trenches. And uh, somebody starts singing a Christmas carol. And somebody on the other side starts singing it too. And then some nitwit actually got up <laughs> while he was backlit and walked out into the middle of no man's land with a bunch of Christmas presents. And then a whole bunch of guys came out from both sides and they played goddamn soccer. Right? Now, there's something completely surreal about people who are about to kill each other taking a Christmas holiday. And yet, on the other hand, uh, this may be one of the few in, uh, one of the few contagious outbreaks of sanity you're ever going to see in history. You know, I kind of like the idea. Now, of course, uh, a couple of days later, this, all, this went for about 48 hours. A couple of days later, the officers on both sides come in with special enforcement squads, and they say, you get back to your uh, your bunker or your trench and you start killing people or we're going to kill you now so they did force everybody back but <clears throat> it was one of those things where damn i would not have expected that <laughs> so i give that to you steve but my point is that this is extremely rare right and in the other case oh, i don't think it happens very often and uh that goodness breaks out uh, in some inexplicable way. It happens sometimes, but damned if I know why, and I don't think it's predictable. If you're going to make your policy decisions on the assumption that that's going to happen, my sense is you may well get your heart broken a lot. Yeah, I think uh, Gandhi was saying that what Jesus is saying is not just, uh, as you were describing it, that it is rational to do it this way, to achieve our aim, Gandhi says, we'll just sit there and take it. And I think Martin Luther King here and where I live, you know, the blacks sitting at the counters, you know, taking it from people until people realize, yeah, look what an asshole I am. I, I got to stop this. Well, okay. You know, uh, progress is possible if not, if it's not necessary, it's uh, in other words, it's, it's contingent, but we actually can achieve progress. Things can get better. And yeah, I actually believe that there is such a thing. On the other hand, uh, I'm not a fan of the idea of perfection. I think that our progress is inevitably asymptotic. That's what in some ways uh, the Bible is telling us, look, I'm in charge. You can be good, and I expect you to be good, but don't get the idea that you're going to get all Greek and per perfect. Leave that to Plato. <laughs> you guys are going to get but so good, and that's actually as good as anybody can really practically hope for. So, you know, and what it would lead to, I think, is a kind of uh, practical, non-revolutionary politics. In other words, we can make changes without cutting each other's throats. And, you know, you seem to be like the kind of thinker, uh, Steve, that would be uh, very easily approachable by people that you disagree with, right? I mean, you're a rational, you're a reasonable guy. You seem to be a man of goodwill. Remember what we did, what I did with your manuscript? I disagreed with lots of stuff, but, you know, there's nobody I'd like to talk to more. And uh, regrettably, I think to some extent we've lost that now. This younger generation is really, really bitter. bitter. Uh, and I, I, th I see uh, an increasing hardening of political stances. And I wonder why that's the case, because we're going in the wrong direction if that's happening. Uh, just just, just a, a, a note, uh, I think some of us on this call was reading uh, Elinsky's uh, Rules for Radical. And, okay, well, uh, I had never uh, uh, assigned that. 
but you guys did, I think, between courses. Okay. I know. Yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> no, it was uh, from, I think, four or five months ago. We were just reading. And um, uh, basically, it was interesting take on Gandhi because at the time, it was actually um, uh, the logical thing to do and the most um, effective way to... Uh, to basically, um, you know, uh, achieve their goal is to sit there. If they had weapons, they probably would have done otherwise. And that that was, yeah, you know, that 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 was what Alinsky basically was suggesting, which is very interesting. Um, my guess is is that uh, Malcolm X and the Black Power advocates like Stokely Carmichael that used to march around in black leather and you know, with long guns and stuff, um, that they were never really a uh, serious possibility in threatening the status quo. I think they worked in some ways, if you know football, they were like blocking backs. And then as you said, some great big fella up ahead of you, and he he moves out the most important of your uh, opponents. And that allows you to move. I think that to a great extent, guys like Malcolm X made it possible, sprang Martin Luther King because he gave him the blocking he needed to say, look, uh, if you don't want violent revolution, then you're going to have to be reasonable, right? So there's a place for that. But it's also true, you know, the old great grandmaster Nimzovich, he said, uh, uh, the threat is more powerful than its execution. There are a lot of times when you can threaten that, and it makes people a lot more reasonable. Uh, I'm a historian, and I once read a, a guy in the 19th century who said that many toothaches get cured just by having a look at the dental instruments. Right? <laughs> yeah, I just one look at that, and I said, I live with the tooth. Right. <laughs> and so when Malcolm X or uh, Stokely Carmichael, uh, you know, uh, show the radical, militant, potentially violent element here, everybody says, well, uh, my tooth needs not that, <laughs> not that. And uh, so there's a place for it and there's a place for the bluff. But the problem is that the bluff isn't going to work unless somebody sometimes actually does it. Okay. And uh, you're right. This is the importance of the subjective when we're thinking about medicine. A lot of the outcomes with treatment come from the individual's mindset. And I think when we've moved from that subjective to objective, we've acted in a lot of ways that have hurt people and have hurt nature. Like we're not fully uh, uh, recognizing the power of medicine. Like we might use our medicines and hurt people. We might use our surgery because we're so well-trained in surgery and use it unneedlessly. When, like, for example, I'm an osteopath and I've used my skills to treat people's trigger finger and I prevented three people from having to get the surgery with simple releases and exercises. But the surgeon, they have their knife and they see a solution in that knife. You know, so I think we've missed a lot when we've taken things to objective levels and are just chasing small objects rather than looking at the whole subject. I mean, I think that's a really interesting argument. Um, it does require an awful lot of a doctor. I mean, my sense is that it's hard enough to figure out in the objective sense to solve the puzzle of what's wrong with this person. Why do they have this set? Why do they present this set of symptoms? Now, to try at the same time, which is by no means a bad idea, but it sounds really difficult to think. Suppose I were a different kind of doctor or, or had a different set, uh, set of assumptions. How would I handle this? Um, it doesn't sound to me impossible, but it sounds to me like a very difficult thing, not just for doctors, but for anybody in any kind of activity. Uh, in uh, engineering, well, what are the different ways in which we might think this through, right? Uh, in uh, politics, again, What's a new way? How do my opponents look at this and what's correct about that? Not easy to do, but uh, I think you're right. The greater you can expand your imagination, the better off that you're going to be. Uh, one of the things that I've always thought was important about uh, 
uh, the kind of things I teach these books is that it educates people's imagination. And that actually is at least important as important as sharpening up their logical capacities. In addition to that, I'm trying to show them what I think are better as opposed to worse states of being. And these better states of being are otherwise described as virtues. So I think things like a work ethic, I think things like uh, gratitude for the things you've been given. Uh, I think, uh, uh, a refusal not to develop the talents you have. These are things that I try and teach my students, regardless of what the class is. And I think that, yeah, that's part of being a teacher, but it's an, it's not easy to balance all of those things. And God bless you if you can do so as a doctor. I think this kind of goes and touches into a point uh, I want, I would love to hear your thoughts on. Um, okay. I've been very influenced by uh, McGill Christ and his reading of sort of intellectual history and development. And uh, one of the things that I find um, really uh, compelling um, from his thought is this idea that, okay, yes, like as you described, we are from, depending on how you want to slice and dice it, we are uh, just objectively, there are more of us than there ever have been. We're living longer. Um, and our ability to manipulate the world has vastly increased. Mm -hmm. But one thing that I kind of get from McGilchrist is that our understanding has stayed pretty static. Um, and we are at a stage where we are conflating the ability to manipulate with an understanding. Um, and that leads to all sorts of problems, all sorts of new yeah. problems that we now have that people before us didn't. Uh, a, dis a disconnection from nature, as you said, a disconnection from each other, um, and even medically, a disconnection from the doctor to his patient. Um, so I, I would love to hear what your take is, is on I that. mean, it's very interesting stuff. Uh, there are a lot of themes taken from Heidegger in McGilchrist, and one of the things that I like about him is that he's an astonishing, well-read individual. Uh whether you're a doctor or uh, one of the, a scholar in the soft sciences, this guy is the real thing. So any of you that don't know McGilchrist, uh, the book I would start with is The Master and His Emissary. It's about the two halves of the brain. This guy's an MD and a PhD and uh, is a neurologist and has done all, uh, has accumulated a great deal of interesting data. But uh, I actually believe that he was right. Um, I've always classified people as being intellectually left or right-handed. Uh, it's like Apple and, and Windows. Uh, it's, it, they're in, you know, roughly one to 10 ratio, but, uh, and I think that's probably true for Southpaws too, but uh, there are think, people who think in, uh, in linear connections and those who use images or metaphors and uh, think about, if you know Pascal, what this is, is the esprit de geometrie and the, the esprit de finesse, right? There are geometric thinkers, every mathematical, every mathematician is, and there are thinkers whose uh, thinking involves uh, subtlety and finesse rather than the brute force of logic, which is undeniable. I mean, think about somebody like, uh, think of the late Harold Bloom. That guy had read everything in creation. If you've ever seen his book on the Western canon, when he, his, the last hundred pages is, the, is his recommended book list to us. Okay. And that's just the literature. He doesn't do the philosophy. All right. Well, this guy probably couldn't do quantum mechanics, but the way the the right hand of his brain, the right hemisphere of his brain worked. He was able to correlate all kinds of things that are by no means easy to do. Because again, I, I, I heard that he didn't have a TV until he was in his 40s. Okay, so this is a guy who read every day of his life and now had this gigantic knowledge that he carried around all the time. Um, there, in order to be a teacher of that, you have to be subtle as a as a serpent right? and not necessarily guileless as a dove but you also have to be um able to finesse small distinctions 
right? He's the kind of guy who would break his brain, as he would say, break his brain over an 86-word poem. Now we have something new to break our brain over. That's something he actually wrote somewhere. Okay, you can break your brain over equations, or you can break your brain over uh, <laughs> Ezra Pound writing haiku in italic. Okay, um, that's actually a brain breaker if you give it some, if you give it a chance. So uh, my guess is is that there are two actual stances, uh, one which is linear and one which is curved. Right. And Darren Staloff, if you've seen any of his lectures, uh, or, or Professor Feldman here, uh, who, I, who I went to college with, I mean, these guys are linear. And if you give them a, a question that has a real answer, they're going to tell it to you because it has a real answer. Uh, me, uh, I shy away from anything that has a real answer, although I can give you a variety of interesting musings on whatever it is I've been asked without actually being able to say uh, exactly what the answer to this is, because I don't understand the question with any degree of precision. Uh, <laughs> uh, the soft sciences are, are a, demand a different kind of mental regimen. Uh, it's it's in some ways the difference between being a, a hundred yard dash linear guy and the long cross country. You know, I'm going to run through the mountains, all right. And it's a much more varied and uh, up and down and uh, complex. Oh, I don't know. If complex is the right word because what they does, what these guys do, is so complex. Ask Dr. Feldman uh, that I have no idea what's going on. Uh, but what I've been hoping to do with my class and you know with the doctors in particular is to show them some cool stuff about the history of science and then to use that to show you some cool stuff about uh the uh, development of culture next week next month we're going to be reading Aeschylus's Oresteia and what we have here is three tragedies the first two are good tragedies in the sense that they behave themselves somebody dies at the end that's how you know it's a tragedy. They're dead. The third part doesn't end in a tragedy. It ends in a parade. What kind of tragedy is that? Ah, uh, it's a new tragedy for a new world. And uh, that's part of what I'm going to try and show you. But I'm going to bring you into this new world. So we'll read uh, some of the great tragedians. And you'll find that it takes about an hour to read each one of those. So it's about a three-hour read. It really You'll like it because it doesn't have anything to do with medicine. All right. And it's actually a, quite an enjoyable, interesting read. And uh, two months after that, we're going to finally get to Thucydides. Now, here we have the new social science that emerges as a result of the previous century's natural scientific revolution. It's called scientific history. And you know what he's going to do? He's going to talk about the plague in Athens because he gets it, but he survives. And he says, don't bother with any sacrifices at the temple because this doesn't come from Apollo and people that made sacrifices and people that didn't died. And people that, in other words, we did a double blind experiment here and there is no relation between performing sacrifices to Apollo and being alive. So what I would recommend you do is boot out all that Homeric stuff about offending Apollo and let's enter a new world where stuff don't, doesn't, don't have or events don't have magical causes. Do you see what I'm saying? Once they did that with, na with nature, they didn't have any choice but to do it with society, with humanity. Because look, people are always asking, who am I? And the answer is, I'm a conscious subject. And then the question is, where am I? And the answer is, embedded in nature. And then the next question is, what's that? And when the, you get the answer to what that is, if it's full of spooks and spirits, you're going to employ the appropriate technology. You'll dance and you'll sing a little song and you'll shake the magic rattle and you'll see if you can manipulate nature like that. And what's horrible about randomness is that occasionally you do. All right, so this is going to cause a tremendous amount of confusion and difficulty. Imagine, you know, 2500 BC, 
there's been a lack of snow in the mountains someplace in Africa. So the Nile is late in rising. We send the head priest out there. He does a little dance. Uh, he invokes uh, the gods and stuff, and he sacrifices a bull and gives it some stuff, and uh, Nile doesn't do anything. All right, uh, his days are numbered. We send out number two, say, look, <laughs> we got to get the Nile, the Nile's attention. So talk to the Nile, offer, figure out what it wants, and get it to flood, because we got to have this thing flood. And this is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. If the Nile doesn't like you, you don't belong as I, as Ed Breast. We're going to do that three, four, five, 12, 15 times. Eventually, the Nile is going to rise. Then there will be no doubt in anybody's mind. First of all, that's our man. Second of all, he has magical powers, and the Nile likes him. The proof is that the Nile did what he asked. And so if anybody asks, why do we obey the priests? It's because they're connected to the gods. Can you make the Nile rise? Hell no. Right? So um, the ancients were not using religion to dupe the masses. They were just as duped as anybody else because it's the only game in town. So Dr. I mean, Sugar. Yeah. What, what do you think we have lost from this transition? Because this, this, these ancient ways had a lot of benefits to our health and to our respect for the environment, to our respect for one another. Okay. Uh, um, I'd like to hear I what don't you believe that. Lost. Okay. First off, um, our respect for one another, um, much of human history is composed of suffering. And what I notice is uh, there's a tendency towards genocidal conflict every place where numbers get big enough to, to do that. Um, so uh, we are aggressive, but we are teachable. We are uh, we can be hostile, but also compassionate. We're a Janus-based species. Now, what have we lost? Well, I think we've lost uh, liberty. Okay, but what we did was trade liberty in for a different kind of freedom. What I mean by that is that we traded in liberty, and what we got with civilization and the extension of society was autonomy. Let me see if I can explain to you the difference, why I think they're different. When I was a younger man, many of my mistakes came from the fact that I didn't understand what freedom really was. I thought freedom was liberty, and that meant doing whatever I want, and that meant I was uncoercible and wild. Right? I was, I was a truly out of control undergraduate. But, <laughs> all right, it wasn't until I, no, it wasn't until I matured a little and reassessed this that I came to a different idea of what it means to be free. Let me give you an example, see if this makes sense to you. Um, we have a, a, an alcoholic. A year ago, he went dry because he decided that this was making a mess of his life. He wrapped his car around a tree. The, the wife left and took the kids and he got fired from his job. Uh, I've never heard anybody give alcohol up for no reason. <laughs> There's always a good reason. And I like the story. Okay, so he gives it up. Now, I bring him a glass and a bottle of really good scotch. And I said, you are free, my friend. If you want it, pour yourself up. That's the good stuff. And if you decline it, that's up to you. You can decide that. Now, if what you mean by freedom is liberty, what that means is the ability to realize you're a libido without any impediments. And his libido still loves that scotch. And uh, if freedom is liberty, then he's going to open it up and finish the entire bottle. On the other hand, he might also say, look, I was enslaved to that stuff before because I was enslaved to my libido. And actually, there's no harder taskmaster. So what I did was I stepped back and made rules for myself. And now I do my best to obey these rules conscientiously. And that is auto nomos, making laws for yourself. Now, here's the question. Is freedom lawless or lawful? Which choice in that fork in the road shows us a free man? When I was younger, I was thinking, man, do what you want. 
that leads to chaos. Um, as I got older, and it was much better for me, it kept me alive, uh, I decided that making rules for myself and then enforcing them conscientiously uh, was generally freeing because it freed me from the libido crack and swip over my head. Uh, most of the, guy, the people here are gentlemen. Let me ask you, have any of you had a problem with women ever? Aha, don't you lie to me. Every one of you have. All right. Depends what you mean, really, Mike. <laughs> you don't, don't give me any lies. Every one of you has. I wish I had problems with women. <laughs> well, well, look, everybody has, has them sooner or later. All right. As Genghis Khan said, there are two things you need to know uh, to understand women. And nobody knows what they are. Uh, which is true, right? Um, but you guys, uh, when were you free? Were you free at 19 when uh, your when testosterone was making so many of your choices? Or let's say a little bit later, when uh, you're not secreting the equivalent of five shots of alcohol in terms of judgment because of your endocrine system. Uh, which is the real freedom? Liberty? or autonomy. Let me make a platonic move here, maybe help you guys out. Plato's Republic. He says, if we want to look at what a, a good human being is and what a good psyche is, we perhaps ought to be able to see it better if we increase the size. And Plato says, look, the city is like the man. So why don't we examine a whole coherent society, a city, what, what, we would call nowadays a country or a nation. And you'll see better what the topics under discussion are. Okay, now let's stop and think about liberty and autonomy in a political rather than an individual context. All right. Um, liberty for everybody, which is equal and complete, is anarchism. And I'm not sufficiently optimistic about human nature to think that it won't turn into, uh, I don't know, have you ever seen uh, any of the videos of large cities during a blackout? Yeah, um, I I'm not optimistic that people are going to be grooving together and sustainably, you know, with nature. And uh, I think that there's going to be a, there's a reason why we have laws and it's to restrain things like violence. And we're going to see a lot of it when uh, the law is no law, is at least for a time not enforced. So that is at the political sense, uh, maximizing liberty as your political goal. That's what anarchism is. Everybody gets no no gods. Uh, what is it? No gods, no masters. Well, okay, that means that you've accepted servitude to your libido. You like those masters better. Now, the other side, think of a country that instead of being at a state of absolute liberty is in a state of autonomy. They would have a legislature or a parliament where they would send people to, to deliberate about what laws we should make for ourselves. And then what's the best way to conscientiously enforce these laws? And that's called uh, <laughs> uh, society or civilization. And so going back now, um, the best, one of the best things that ever happened to me in my life was to finally understand what freedom was. At a young age, it's pardonable and understandable that you think that freedom is liberty. Uh, <laughs> it's, you'll learn as a natural outcome of that. But um, if you get to the point where freedom becomes autonomy, then you're choosing Kant over Foucault. Come on, somebody must have a question. Or have I just like, shut everything yeah, down? We were talking well, about like every advance in our oh, yeah. uh, scientific understanding. We generally get a change in everything else. But, you know, interestingly enough, we haven't really seen that in government. And I feel like our government is still in a very old fashioned way where we have these representatives that we needed because we had to send a delegate on a horse buggy 
to Washington, D.C. Okay. Uh, I think you're wrong. And I think you're, you're wrong in a really interesting, smart way. In other words, um, I give people A's for less than you just did, all right? Uh, when I was, no, when I was teaching, what I really liked is people who are wrong in interesting ways. It's a sign of genius and it can't be taught. I mean, every one of you that's a teacher knows uh, that's an outer, you know, I, I wouldn't have thought of that. That's the student you want in your class. So, yeah, I, I like that. Um, so uh, what is it you think we've lost again? Uh, well, no, I'm, I'm saying we we haven't really had a change in government. Since oh, OK, we've... government. Yes, I think we have. <laughs> you think about this, all right, from the ancient world, and here I'm talking about before uh, the River Valley civilizations. But let's start about 3000 BC there. All political legitimacy was tied to religion, right? So the reason why you had to obey Hammurabi is because he was the cousin of Shemesh or something. You know, there'll be some myth mythology for why you have to do that. So politics and religion are inextricable to begin with, right? Religion doesn't differ... Uh, uh, Civilization doesn't begin to differentiate these different activities for many centuries, okay? So this, and what that means is, is that the reason why you have to obey the government or the reason why you have to, why a farmer has to obey the priests is that the gods above have chosen our ruler who chose the various functionaries and aristocrats and they, and below them are all the farmers and craftsmen and below them are animals. And in other words, it's a top-down vertical kind of legitimacy, all right? And what that means is that everybody has obligations because the person above you has a legitimate claim on your life, your activity, your wealth. But you don't have any legitimate claim on them. In other words, you, because God supports the king and the king supports the aristocrats, if you're a serf and you say the aristocrat is treating me badly, well, and since he's authorized by the king, who's authorized by God, that means you don't like God and that means we have to kill you. So there's no such thing as legitimate dissent while you have religious politics. Okay, now this lasts until... The breakup of the Middle Ages, which is starts about the time of Thomas Aquinas. He's the last gasp of the Middle Ages. You'd be surprised how early interesting, important stuff is, like Fibonacci doing mathematics and uh, the development of musical notation and the development of eyeglasses. So they're working on optics. Uh, the first graphing of functions goes on in Oxford in the 1300s. So they're actually doing more than people realize. What really cuts the uh, early from late Renaissance off is the Black Death, 1348. Now, uh, uh, went too far. Uh, please just prompt me and I'll get it. Well, since like, uh, since like social media, for example, that, that was a huge advance. We haven't really seen a change in government, maybe in China. Oh, okay, they, here's they, the government. I'm sorry. That was all the word I needed. I'm sorry. It's just I have aphasia because of the meds I take. Government. Um, there's a, Now, when we get a new science called Newtonian mechanics, you all know what that is, right? Um, and that's the culmination of the process of development of physics that begins with Copernicus and Kepler, goes through Galileo, and gets us to, uh, and even Descartes, we're going to have to bring in, and Bacon. But the high point of this is Isaac Newton. Um, and the key thing here is that Isaac Newton gives us a new scientific revolution. In other words, Newtonian uh, science takes over. That's the science 3.0 and does everything that the Greek science did and adds some things to it that make it much more effective and much more powerful. Now, I won't, I won't go into that just yet, but here's the deal. Like I said, every time you have a scientific revolution, you have to have a revolution in politics. And there was a revolution in politics response to this. It's called social contractarianism. People come up with a new idea. It's not a top-down legitimacy. It's a bottom-up legitimacy from all these cavemen living in the state of nature, which means that God doesn't create governments. People do. And what that means is that governments are fallible because they don't have divine authorization. 
So now you're going to get a whole new interesting collection of ideas like rights. The ancient Greeks don't even have a word for rights. They have a word for duties, but you don't have rights uh, because you don't get to tell the guy ahead of you, uh, above you what you demand. On the other hand, once government moves from top down to bottom up, that means that the person that's made the prince or the king or the aristocrats or the people that can vote in a democracy, whoever they are, they're just as fallible as you are. So you're going to get new ideas like the right to... Uh, um, dissent. Legitimate dissent is a very complicated, very difficult idea. Uh, what we also get in the age of revolution is the abolition of traditional monarchies in favor of parliamentary reforms. Think of the English Revolution, 1640 to 60, the American Revolution, uh, 1776 to 89, and then the French Revolution, 1789 to uh, uh, 92, and then the sequelae. But the point is that there was a revolution in politics, and you're living in it. There was another revolution in politics that came when we got to science 4.0, which is the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. That's the quantum universe and relativity. So let's get, let's say the, the milepost, the end of science of Newtonian mechanics and that, that regime of science. Let's call it... Uh, 15, let's call it 1859, Origin of Species. Now, last half of the 19th century, we get some new mathematics. Cantor is investigating some new cool paradoxes. And eventually this is going to lead to Gödel's pulling the plug on mathematics, which you know, is going to cause a great deal of unhappiness. And uh, what they're going to try and do is formulate a new account of the physical world. Because as they started to look inside the atom, the results that they got observationally were different from what Newtonian mechanics predicted. And as that became replicated, they knew they had a crisis. And so what, uh, what the uh, creators of relativity, Einstein and Bose and the rest of those guys, plus uh, those who created quantum mechanics, you know, Heisenberg and Bohr and those guys, um, what they did was create a scientific revolution. It was not unified, but it may be unified when we get to science 5.0. We don't know if that's going to happen, but it might. Point is this, though. As soon as you break up uh, the former Newtonian mechanics, you're going to have to transform the art and the law and the psychology and the ethics and the politics, because that's what has to happen after you have a, a scientific revolution. Newtonian mechanics not only generates a revolution in politics, generates a revolution in literature. Here's what it is. The novel supersedes the epic. You look around, you probably notice that there's nobody writing epics anymore. It's not that it isn't a good form to telling a story. It's just that it helps if everybody around you is illiterate and you memorize it. Because that's pretty much, that's, that's usually how epics work until we get to literate epics like uh, the Aeneid. Okay. But epic is the original literary form. And it works great because almost nobody can read and there's no way of printing books. So it's a very useful way of bringing together knowledge and creating a kind of solidarity. Right. Uh, the heroes of the Homeric poems are super Greeks. Gilgamesh is a super Mesopotamian. Uh, Sundiata in West Africa is a super Muslim. Uh, El Cid in Spain is a super Catholic. And he represents all of us in a way. Now, nobody does that anymore. The reason why is that now people can read. And we also have the printing press. So we can have cheap copies distributed to lots of people. You got a middle class that's not completely impoverished. You got widespread literacy. And so... The last great epic uh, in English is Paradise Lost, 1650. Milton is right on schedule. And then the last great uh, epic in the West altogether was Goethe's Faust. And that's late 18th, beginning of the 19th century. That's because Germany comes late to the party because they had the wars of the Reformation there. So they had to rebuild their cities and stuff and their population. So they're kind of the rear guard of the Enlightenment, which mostly happens in England and France. But my point is that uh, 
There's a change in literature. Uh, there's a change in politics. There's a change in art. Uh, the art of the revolutionary era is deeply influenced by classicism. Do you know uh, David? I mean, all the paintings look so stiff and formal. Uh, the people look like the marble columns that are next to them, right? There's not much motion. There's not much. Or th think of David's death of Socrates. I point my finger up and everybody else is crying, but it's frozen. Now, move a little further to the post-revolutionary period. And when we get to romanticism, we're going to get a response against that kind of art. And by implication, romanticism isn't going to like science very much either. And that's why it's one of the great romantic achievements to have produced right on time, Frankenstein. Frankenstein is about fear of technology and science. It's also an allegory about the French Revolution, which unleashed monstrous destruction and misery and murder that nobody knew how to control once they got, once the genie got out of the bottle. So, uh, yeah, what I'm going to, what I'm prepared to do is to look at pretty close to every domain in the, the soft sciences. And I can tell you um, where it develops, uh, what it develops in response to, and uh, how it integrates with the conception of the world that they have then. In other words, we get tremendous achievements during the Enlightenment. The problem is that like all, like all touts, they oversell the Enlightenment. Uh, Leibniz's cosmic optimism, sweet reason is going to solve all our problems. Well, that may have felt like a plausible argument if you're living through the wars of the Reformation, when people are being butchered over questions of dogma. But the problem is, although we changed the focus of culture, Human nature didn't change. So our aggression and cruelty um, moved from a religious lingo to a political lingo. And now we kill people be because they're on the wrong side of history or whatever they want, because they're opposed to democracy and they want to go back to monarchy. So the point is, we didn't become much less violent. We justified our misdeeds for one of them, or we, we rationalize them using a different vocabulary. And that's why the romantics break away from this. They say, look, you claimed that reason was going to solve all our problems, and it didn't. As a matter of fact, it generated a bunch of new ones, which is perhaps what you were gesturing at, that every development, every step forward is also a step back. I don't believe that's exactly true. I think that it's possible to take more steps forward than steps back. Let me give you an example, okay, why I take the idea of progress seriously. Um, the, two, the two things that I'm proudest of in the history of the West is the abolition of slavery and the emancipation of women, right? These are recent things, and these spread from the West outward. Now, remember that the West and white is not the same thing. Toussaint Louverture leads a revolution of black slaves in Haiti in 1792, while the French Revolution, the terror is going on. And he is spouting all these French revolutionary doctrines saying, um, we deserve to be free because of the uh, rights of man and all the stuff that the French Revolution was ostensibly about. So um, this is the world's second successful anti-colonial rebellion. And these guys, are products of the French Enlightenment. They didn't claim to be killing other people on account of the fact that uh, for some African ideology or for some Christian religion or for some sect, they did it because they thought they were entitled to be free. And they've been hearing this from the ideologues of the French Revolution for at least a generation prior to the, revolu to the French Revolution itself. And they said, we're going with this. So this is the Black West. <laughs> it is. I mean, there's nothing else to call it. So the argument I would make then is that the West, the greatest thing it did was the abolition of slavery, slavery globally. Now, I know that there still exists human trafficking, but this was a big step forward to abolish the slave trade internationally and then to emancipate the slaves 
globally. Now, it took a long time, and there are still people in bondage, regrettably, but this was the product of a bunch of Enlightenment thinkers who were deeply affected by uh, a radical, by a, a kind of radical Protestantism. Uh, the leaders of the anti-slavery movement were the Quakers. They were very rich. These are merchants often in Philadelphia, but in other parts of the U.S. too. They free their slaves out of conscience, and then they insist on pursuing anti-slavery policies in the new nation. So um, the abolition of slavery is, an, is one of the achievements of the West, and I'm really proud of it. God knows they did enough bad stuff. God knows that they eliminated and destroyed and raped and pillaged their way across the globe. But there were also offsetting really great achievements. One of them is the global abolition of slavery. Second is the emancipation of women, which is often done by the same people that had agitated for the abolition of slavery. And uh, granted, it's been slow and halting, but it's a real thing. And women are better off now than they were, I think, 500 years ago. Uh, their fathers don't decide who they marry. <laughs> they are not subject to uh, marital arrangements. Uh, they are. Uh, uh, they have the right to own property and to express their political opinions. So, yeah, I think the women are better off now. And I think it's part of this emancipatory project. Now, there's lots of things to be ashamed of in the history of the West. I mean, if you think of the extermination of whole continents. But... Um, all the good stuff that was done and all the bad stuff that was done, it's over. And all we have is here and now. So what are we going to do with it? We're going to launch ourselves at each other's throats. Or are we going to find us a way, this is what I, would, I think Dr. Feldman might like, of cooperating to get together. And we ought to be able to reason together. Not every problem can be reasoned out, but some can. And uh, I'm hoping that talking to people and uh, trying to, uh, well, teaching allows me not to go crazy because if I don't can't teach, I don't know what to do. I stalk around the house. It's just horrible. You know, I mean, the, look, retirement will kill you. Don't look forward to it. So I just found myself a way of teaching people because I, I have to do this. I'll go nuts. But also um, I feel like I should do it before I'm gone. My my brain is is pretty weak, and I'm I'm, I'm dumb and getting dumber. But uh, while I can still talk, even though I need to be have it explained to me what I'm saying occasionally, uh, I really like doing this, and I feel like I'm obligated to do it. In the same way, look, I have a my my oncologist. He's seventy years old, and he's a badass. I mean, he's a you know he's he's a board certified in three things. So he just really likes medical stuff and likes knowing all this. And I have really great talks with him. And uh, I find that uh, if I have people that I can talk to, uh, for me, uh, cancer is easier to deal with. And also, um, I like to have fun with different groups. And I thought a, a set of doctors might be an interesting bunch. Uh, I'm going to try very much to get this guy, Michael Sagru, who's over in, in Northern Ireland someplace. And of course, he's going to think it's some internet scam, right? You know, uh, the, nobody's going to, that's why they won't put me through to anybody. I have a roommate from Columbia, went to Columbia Med. And uh, <laughs> uh, I know he's in Detroit. I know what he does, but there's no way to get to the guy. It's like trying to call the Pope, right? And you, the, 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 the rest of you are probably like that too. What's his name? Uh, what? Oh, What's his name? His Maybe name I can find it for you. Jeff Jennings. He's a pulmonologist, Columbia University, physicians and surgeons. And he's at the Henry Ford Medical Center. Apparently, he's surrounded by guard dogs and barbed wire and stuff. You got to call and pretend that you're a physician to get through to him. He looks know. really young. Well, you know, uh, physician heal thyself. I thought it would be kind of more interesting to uh, uh, send my thoughts on surgery to some medical journal that wants to know what I think about it. And it turns out I think it's really great. Uh, I don't know that I can come too much more specific than that. But when people need surgery, 
they should be attended to by surgeons. Um, I'm not sure they want these this level of insight. So I figure that perhaps he has a whole collection of things that I got invited to that I should actually be responding to. So I'm going to try and bring the guy in. I've actually never met him. And besides being a, a doctor, he's a poet. Who knows? Uh, there are others that I've been trying to get, and uh, I haven't been able to get to them either. But I will continue trying. And if any of you know some kind of... Uh, back way of doing this it look i mean just from the look on dr felbin's face he says aha this has a unique right answer i mean i, I know what's going on there of uh, dr felbin and i went to college together and he did well uh so well that other natural sciences were afraid of him what he was the curve buster don't tell me differently no i mean you go in and you realize that he's going to get 96 and the next Highest grade is going to be 71, and everybody's screwed. Right. And people would walk out when this guy showed up in class. So, yeah, now he knows a great deal about medicine. And I know there's a whole bunch of you here that know a great deal about medicine, and I'm happy to hear it. Uh, I hope that you went and fixed something that was messed up. God knows there's enough of that. I have a, I have a question, actually, for, for both you, Mike, and, and Steve. Um, yeah. Just... Uh, I guess a question asking a bit more for wisdom as someone to going back all the way to you talking about, you know, two types of people, people who are linear, like Dr. Feldman and people who are more sort of make connections. And um, I I'm studying neuroscience uh, at the moment and, in, and I'm realizing more and more that I'm someone who makes connections and finding studying neuroscience surrounded by people, a bunch of people who are very linear incredibly frustrating because I recognize the importance and like uh, the, the, the correctness of linear thought, but um, the, this, they, they get so stuck in like the, the linear things that they can't see these bigger pictures, uh, kind of like what Jeffrey was saying before. And I have almost this, this, this thought and idea that's in the back of my head of um again, going back all the way, Miguel Christ, who's been a big influence on me, a kind of intellectual project that I have no idea that will ever happen. But starting in neuroscience, I'm really interested in neuroscience of language, and then moving into philosophy from there, and then moving into theology out of that to show almost why all of these things are connected and why they need to be talking to each other, because at the moment, they're not. Um, so I don't That's know. Like I the idea. My a question is more just like, what you mean by wisdom. theology? Um, so I'm, what? I'm kind of like, I'll give you my general, general thought, basically like right. neuroscience of language. I want to build up a, a philosophical system based on what I find in neuroscience. And then I think you need metaphysics for language to work. And if you have metaphysics, then the question then becomes, well, how does that, what is that metaphysics? Like, what is that spooky whatever it is and how does it engage with us and i think that's the realm of theology um so that's kind of my Good god i'm not sure theology is possible i mean i'll be very interested in seeing what you do uh i don't doubt well look think of it this way all right it's a wittgensteinian point we all know what coffee smells like but if i asked you what does coffee smell like nobody knows what they're supposed to say on account of the fact that nobody knows how to describe the smell of coffee, although it's a perfectly prosaic thing, nothing mysterious about it. Well, if our language is an insufficiently robust instrument to talk about the small smell of coffee, um, what do you think your chances are of describing absolute reality or the absolute truth? I don't doubt that it exists. I doubt that there's anything to say about it. I think that there's nothing to say about it from like a perfect Greek standpoint. We're never going to get this because again, I, I guess, I mean, I'm kind of betraying my hand here. I, I think that um, being is becoming, I think that God, God's being is fundamentally becoming. And for me, the, the theology is any good theology is, is going to engage with God as a relationship and you never get to the end of a relationship. Like a relationship is by definition ongoing and dynamic. Um, 
And uh, I guess like, going back all the way to to my own question, because that's kind of like my own like my own pipe dream, my own insanity. Um, but like as someone who is also a connection maker, how do you stay sane in a world filled with people who are linear who don't seem to be willing to or able to engage with the kind of more subtle arguments and thought that that you that drives you okay um i'm right brained which means i'm intellectually left handed um my relationship to speech is strained and unusual uh think of it this way my pal and my kind of alter ego dr staloff is a real linear guy. It's like having a real fast, a real good fastball pitcher on your baseball team. He'll throw it right down the pipe and dare you to hit it because he really leans on it. All the linear guys, I'm thinking of you, Dr. Feldman, uh, get the right answer and, and said, no, this is the right answer. And he's right. Um, but there are questions that can't be addressed and, can, and targets that can't be hit with a pure linear argument. And that's why um, adding in uh, images, metaphors, uh, which remember that metaphor is a kind of meaningful nonsense. It's not logical by definition because you don't have like or as. Instead you say X is Y where X is not Y. So some metaphors work, uh, but very few do. Most times when you say that X is Y, it doesn't mean anything at all. Uh, but metaphor is a kind of communication which pushes off the bounds of, uh, of uh, formal logic. Why? Because it's literally nonsensical. It's literally contradictory. Um, on the other hand, um, the ability to deploy metaphors and to sustain metaphors is, uh, is a way of fusing art and science. Uh, when I used to give lectures, this was a long time ago, the ones that are on the air, um, when I come off the stage and take the mic off, with 30 seconds after the lecture is over, I remember nothing of what I did. I can't access any of it. It's like when you dream, there's a tiny fraction of a, a few seconds when you wake up and you remember what the dream is, but quickly it goes down the the rabbit hole wherever dreams go but you've probably have had that experience okay that happens to me when i talk about the stuff that i do uh, i don't listen to my own lectures i don't know why anybody, i mean for the same reason my mother didn't need her own cooking right it was somebody else but uh sometimes when i have heard it um i've stopped to say to myself wow i didn't know i knew that that's kind of interesting and that's a very strange relationship to have with one's own work so what i'm doing is i'm not I think this is, this is what happens in the uh, left hemisphere. Um, I'm thinking not in sentences, but in paragraphs. And I'm not talking, I'm singing. I had a, a cousin when I was a kid who had a problem, a speech impediment. He stuttered. And the speech therapist fixed his stutter by having him sing sentences rather than speak them. Because apparently there's a different part of the brain you know, it gets that job. Well, okay, I'm singing in these lectures. It may not sound it because my voice is awful and my range may be three notes, but uh, <laughs> um, it is tapping into that part of my brain, which is why I don't remember and don't even construct separately individual sentences. I'm taking this a paragraph at a time and this is a kind of scat singing, except that it's supposed to mean something. I don't know how to explain it any better than that. And that's no explanation at all. No, thank you. That I, I've never heard anyone like explain my own mental process to me better than that. I get okay. exactly what you mean. Um, all right. Well, we're going to need the concussion protocol for you. <laughs> uh, no, if, if my mental process is, oh, I identify with that. <laughs> Be, beware young man you never know that's gonna put you um i'm kind of sick tonight i don't think i can go much longer but we'll talk in uh 
the future. I don't know what date. I will have my daughter Genevieve fix the dates. See, this is what happens when people allow me to control the logistics. Nobody knows what's going on. I, I don't know what I'm supposed to be teaching. It really doesn't make any difference. But uh, um, I think that there are some people that like the, the order that's involved in uh, kind of a linear connection between uh, what we do and what was on the paper that we were going to do. But I never taught a class like that. I mean, I just used the same uh, syllabus every year and it was different every class because I never wrote my notes down. I just gave it like, what are we doing today? And, and we talk about that. And, uh, you know, that's why I have such a hard time writing stuff down. But I do have, uh, what would it be? Uh, 185,000 words. It's a half million word project, alas. But I can show you some cool shit. And I'm going to teach all you guys some history of science, which is surprisingly connected to the history of religion. Your point, I've this gentleman down here with the glasses, your point is very well taken. I like it. Um, we have lost something and we have gained something. Um, our job is to make sure we winnow out the right stuff. And we don't do it perfectly, but it is possible to winnow out stuff like the subordination of women or slavery. And I hope someday that scarcity can be abolished too. It seems to me that the growth in our co productive capacities and the upcoming uh, leveling off of global population, because as you give women an education and you give them access to birth control, birth rates go down and uh, more, more infants live. And uh, I don't know that it'll ever be equalized, but the idea of being able to put a roof over people's heads and make sure there's food on people's tables, um, I like that as a political goal. I, I think it's in the same league as abolishing slavery and emancipating women. I mean, uh, this is a practical good that we may be able to do. But remember, and this we go to a couple of points you've made. I'll finish with this. Progress is not solving your problems. Solving your problems is called being dead. Progress comes when you trade in your old problems for new problems that you like better. The problem of wage labor and how to deal with racial discrimination is a hell of a lot better problem than slavery. And how to give women access to uh, um, the things which will uh, improve their lives, but also improve the lives of society as we increase the uh, pool of available people that can do a variety of things, we all benefit. And I would like to uh, think that we all benefit by eventually um, abolishing scarcity. It doesn't mean abolishing inequality. That's going to be here forever. But making sure that people don't die in the street, The what I see from American urban areas uh, strikes me as outrageous. And the fact that we haven't done something about this strikes me as culpable folly. But you know, that's something we might aspire towards, hopefully in the not too distant future. Good night, all. Talk to you next time. Bye. Bye, -bye. Thanks so much. Good night, mate. Thank you. Bye -bye.